Are you ready for another law of thermodynamics? We've got the third law of thermodynamics. And this is what's going to enable us to have the foundation needed to calculate the delta S of a reaction. Remember, according to the second law of thermodynamics, the delta S of the universe, which is the system delta S and the surroundings delta S, must be greater than zero to be spontaneous. Also remember that in a couple lessons ago, I taught you how to calculate the delta S of the surroundings by taking the negative delta H of the system, the reaction, and dividing by the temperature in Kelvin. We learned how to do this in a lot of different ways in thermal chemistry, um, and now we can use that information to get the delta S of the surroundings. Now we're ready to look at how to obtain the delta S of the, of the system so that we could utilize the third law of thermodynamics. All right, so standard entropy, I've already told you that standard entropy has got that uh, little circle up there. It's one atmosphere. If the substance is in solution, it's going to be one molar, which I hadn't mentioned before. Those are really the two conditions. If it's a gas, it's at one atmosphere. And if it is in solution, it's one molar. There are tables full of these standard values, okay? So a standard entropy change for a reaction would be, if it were standard, would be written with that little circle there, all right? Now, you can actually use the entropy, because I told you, you can know the value for entropy of substances. You don't always have to talk about changes. So you can determine the entropy of the products and the entropy of the reactants, subtract it, and get the change in entropy for the reaction. But let's just talk a little bit about how you obtain a magnitude value for entropy. So it's just kind of a little bit of side detour conceptually about this. The third law of thermodynamics is this. If you were to take a perfect crystalline substance, okay, what does that mean? That means that every atom is in a perfect alignment. You have no impurities in there whatsoever, and it has formed its crystalline structure in a perfect way. It is a perfect crystalline substance. Nothing is out of place. And you lower the temperature, and you keep lowering the temperature. Now, there's no imperfections, no impurities from that, and the vibration starts slowing and slowing and slowing, and if you could get to absolute zero, they would stop. Okay, no movement at all. Now, how many different ways can you arrange those atoms? There's only one way, and they're all sitting very, very still, and that would be a W, a microstate of one. Now, the natural log of one is zero. So that would be a zero value for the entropy. You start raising the temperature and they start vibrating and you start getting a little bit of entropy. It increases and increases and increases. So no such thing as a negative entropy. You can have no entropy and that would be a perfect crystalline solid at zero Kelvin. And then you can have a value above that. Okay, so you don't know how you don't even know how, but because you have a starting point of what zero is, you can determine values for entropy for different substances and at different temperatures, okay? Um, you don't have to always talk in the world of deltas with the change going on, like we had to do with delta H's um, when we studied those. All right, so entropy is always positive. I said that already. It's got no entropy. If you could get there, you can't really get there because you can never get to absolute zero if you've got a substance involved, but you can approach it, and if you got there, that would be no entropy, no movement, perfect crystal, that zero, and everything's positive from there. So how do we use that information to get the delta S of a reaction, which is our system, okay? You're going to see this equation. It looks very similar to one that we saw with delta H, okay? With delta H, we had um, wherever you see the S on the, on the right side of that equation, you would have seen a delta H, the delta H of the products minus the delta H of the reactants, and you would also have seen a little F formation for them. So in the equation that was equivalent, we 
had delta H of formations that we looked up and we did products minus reactants. We added them all up. But we don't have to talk about a specific reaction, formation reaction, and delta values. We can just go to tables. And if you look up the table and you see a value for a substance and you're given the S, you're saying this is its value. If I had it at 25 degrees Celsius and the condition stated of one atmosphere gas and one molar of solution, this is its value. So, simple equation. I'll rewrite the equation. The delta S of a reaction, which is your system, is equal to the sum of, you use the coefficients of the S's standard of products minus adding up, use the coefficients, the S of products final reactants initial. A typical problem where they're asking you to determine the delta S of the reaction is, well, let's give you the S's, or let's send you off. If it's a homework problem, they might send you off to a table to look the values up. I've given you the values. I'm just going to make sure you can use this equation appropriately. You plug in the numbers and come up with the answer. Well, I sure hope you got a positive 20 kilojoules per mole. If you didn't, let's make sure that you understand what common mistakes are. Common mistakes, you might have forgot to put the two in. It's products. The HCl is 187.0 joules per mole Kelvin. The coefficient of two has a mole with it, so that's leaving the moles out, and it gives me joules per Kelvin. So, one common mistake is to forget that. The other common mistake is not do a subtracting of the full sum. I see a lot of students, and I'll write it out here, will we'll subtract only the first number and then add the second number. So you have minus, there's one mole of H2, and its value for H2 is 131.0 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so you're subtracting the whole sum, so you're also subtracting one, and we'll write mole down here because I'm getting a little tight for space, times the entropy of the Cl2, which is 223. Am I correct? Yes. 223 joules per mole Kelvin. So I'm going to reiterate what I see students do. They'll punch this in, minus the first one, and then they'll add the second one. But you have to subtract the first one and subtract the second one, or add them together first and subtract it, whichever. That's what's going to give you a positive 20. So did the disorder increase or decrease in this reaction? Well, the reaction had a slight increase in the amount of disorder. Okay, so it says there in this previous example, the number of moles of gas did not change. Okay, let's look back at the reaction. I have one mole of hydrogen gas and one mole of chlorine gas on the reactant side. That's two moles of gas. On the product side, I have two moles of gas. So the number of moles of gas did not change. Okay, I want you to think, and, and that really gives rise to a pretty small value. This is in joules per Kelvin, and at 20 joules per Kelvin is a pretty small entropy change. Okay, I want you to think about the change that would occur if you had a net increase in the number of moles of gas. Now for this, I'm going to give you a little reminder of something that I told you. The entropy of a solid is less than the entropy of a liquid. And I said I very often do two of these as I go to the entropy of a gas. It is much, much greater than that of the liquid. The, the liquid is much, much less than that of the gas. So if I have a reaction in which is producing uh, gas, more gas than you started with, what's that going to do to the sign of delta S for the reaction? Well, it makes it positive, and that is always going to be the case. If you have a reaction, that's a quick thing. You can look at a lot of reactions and say increasing entropy, decreasing entropy, increasing, increasing, just by looking at the gases. Are you getting more gas or are you using up gas? If the number of moles of gas don't change, then you can't make a good judgment easily about the entropy change of that reaction. All right, so here's a question for you. This 
we said if you have an increase in the moles of gas, uh, and that's going to give you a positive delta S for the reaction, can we predict that the reaction is spontaneous? Now we catch people with this all the time. They say yes you can because a positive delta S means spontaneous. But look at this. This is delta S of the reaction. Is that our predictor of spontaneity? No, it's not. The predictor of spontaneity is the delta S of what? The delta S of the universe is what predicts spontaneity. So if a reaction has an increase in disorder, if it has a positive delta S, you cannot yet predict whether it's spontaneous or not. You must take it a little bit further and know that. All right, now let's take the same reaction and look through your notes at what's going to be helpful to you. And I want you to calculate the delta G of this reaction. Now, we're utilizing and we're bringing forward the fact that we already calculated the delta S to be 20 joules per Kelvin. And now I'm giving you the delta H. Stop and find the delta G of this reaction. All right, so you now know the answer. Here are the common mistakes. You must watch your units. If you picked B, you didn't watch your units, and you didn't convert that 25 degrees Celsius to Kelvin. And we have got to use, in this case, 298 Kelvin, or it won't get you the right answer. Another common mistake that students do is they just look at the equation. And what equation did you use? You used delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, right? If you're using this equation and you look at what I gave you, I gave you delta H in kilojoules minus 184.6. It's in kilojoules. And then I gave you a delta S and what units it is in? It's in joules per Kelvin. I wish I could convince all my students to write it down, write it out, look at your units, because as soon as you do that and you take the little bit of extra time it takes to do that, you're going to realize you cannot add those two guys together. We say you can't add apples and oranges, okay? You have to get them in the same unit in order to do that. Okay, and the last possible thing that you could have done is you, instead of subtracting, you, you actually added, and the equation's got a minus sign in there. So those are the numbers. You've got to go ahead and convert your joules to kilojoules, so I'll do that last thing. Joules, kilojoules, take the thousand joules to equal a kilojoule, and that will give you the answer. Now. Once you have that value, and it's a negative 190.6, okay, with that negative delta G of the reaction, can we predict that the reaction is spontaneous? Well, yes. You don't have to know the delta S of the universe. The other option is to know the delta G of the reaction. The delta S of the universe must be positive to be spontaneous. The delta G of the reaction must be negative to be spontaneous. So this reaction is spontaneous as it is written. It will occur spontaneously at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we're working our way through understanding whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. We can do it one way. We can do it another way. Um, but we're going to learn another way to calculate delta G that doesn't involve first having to calculate delta H and delta S. That's what we'll do next.